What if new teacher preparation programs and ongoing professional development used incarcerated youth as thought partners to help navigate the challenges of teaching reading? Now, some of you may be thinking that's a far-fetched idea. Others, perhaps, may be thinking crime when you think about incarcerated youth. But after working decades as a principal and with incarcerated youth and examining public education through the perspective of incarcerated youth, I am convinced the teaching of reading in a way that utilizes incarcerated youth's experiences with school failures and reading problems could be our best hope to keep more students in school. But let me be transparent. I haven't always believed this. After graduating from college with a bachelor's degree in physical education, I took a teaching position, teaching physical education, at a juvenile correctional facility. My aspiration was to pursue a career in sports management and teaching was just going to be a stopgap. While I enjoy teaching physical education, I also coach the basketball team. And taking graduate classes in the evening towards earning a degree in sports management, my aspiration was challenged by an experience that remains very personal. You see, on days that the school principal was away from the school building, the assistant principal would take over. And he would often ask me to assist him. And on those days, I kept an eye on teachers, student behaviors, instructional activities, and the interactions between students and teachers. But what I observed in the classrooms was not the physically strong, athletic, coarse, or fearless boys from my physical education classes. Instead, I saw the same boys who were so pathetically uneducated to the point of they were fearful of the classroom. Now, mostly black boys, they could not read or write. Some of them could not spell their first or last names. Some of them did not know their letters or sounds. Some could not tell time. Some, in fact, did not even know, if you asked them, their date of birth. Now, this was a painful reality for me. This was a reality check for me. In fact, it was so disruptive to me that it made me make one of the biggest decisions of my life, to replace my original career goal of sports management with a new goal, education administration. I wanted to be a principal. I wanted to be a principal. Through their educational challenges and despair, my students had convinced me, or at least inspired me, to care more about them, to think about what was really happening in schools, and at the very least, to figure out what was happening with reading instruction. And so I went on back to school for education administration. Now, exactly 10 years after leaving my teaching position at the juvenile correctional facility and subsequently working as a high school and middle school health and physical education teacher, assistant principal, and high school principal, I took over as principal of a local public school inside the Philadelphia prison system. Now, the Philadelphia prison system at that time was the fifth largest urban county jail system in the United States. It had six major correctional facilities on its property, and over 9,000 adult inmates. Among the thousands of adult inmates, 
who were detained in or sentenced to the Philadelphia prison system annually, 250 of them were my new students, juveniles, between the ages of 13 and 17. They were being tried as adults. In this position, I saw the same sad occurrence as I have seen throughout my career as an educator, especially in my earlier career at the juvenile correctional facility, and that was students who cannot read. Now this time, it was not only juveniles, but adults. Just consider this one adult male inmate, who I didn't know at the time, but was 55 years old at the time, as I was moving from the minimum security side of this particular correctional facility to the maximum security side, I took a shortcut through the medical services unit. And out of nowhere it seemed, this frantic adult inmate approached me saying, Mr. Principal, Mr. Principal, I need your help. I'm still in the hooked on phonics class and I want to get my GED. Now, I could see and hear the pain in his voice, but I could also see the anger and frustration in his facial expression. So I paused. I could see that he was tired and very frustrated with carrying the burden of a lifetime of illiteracy. Consider yet another student a juvenile, 16 years old, who, when I was on his cell block, he approached me calmly, but yet boldly, and said, Mr. Pelzer, I'm going to quit school. I said, son, why would you quit school? He said, because I'm 16 years old, and I'm still reading on a first grade level. Now, these two incarcerated individuals had two things in common. One, they clearly understood their educational plight through their reading levels. But two, they knew to express that concern to the principal, the one person who should be able to help them turn around their circumstance. Now, there is no hard evidence that prison officials use reading scores to determine the number of beds they need. And I've worked with many wardens and prison commissioners. And at no time did they ever ask me for reading data to support the number of beds they need. But there is an undeniable connection between literacy and incarceration. In fact, Literacy, stats, and data, and empirical studies confirm this connection of low-level literacy and involvement in the juvenile justice system. For example, 85% of the juveniles who interface with the juvenile justice system are fundamentally illiterate. 40% of juvenile offenders who are at a 10th grade level, which means they are about 15 to 16 years old, read below a fourth grade level. And according to the United States Department of Justice, the link between academic failure, violence, delinquency, and crime is welded in reading failure. Now, we are failing to reach, teach, and engage thousands of children every day. By third grade, they should be making the transition from learning to read to reading to learn. Now, I'm not the only one who believes this. Others agree with me that reading instruction and at the very least helping teachers who struggle with teaching reading need to improve. Teachers, principals, college officials, 
government officials all agree with me. For example, an elementary school principal in the Bronx in 2016 told a CNN reporter that she had, been spent, she had spent the past 10 years trying to find ways to help her teachers teach reading. She also indicated that it was the teacher preparation programs that weren't doing a good job. Former U.S. Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, also indicated in an open letter to college presidents that teacher preparation programs weren't rigorous enough, nor were they keeping up with the times. A group of college deans got together and did a study to link low teacher preparedness and low performing public schools. And in that study, they found that only 39% of the included elementary education teacher preparation programs taught their undergraduate students all five components of reading, phonics, phonemic awareness, comprehension, fluency, vocabulary development. South Carolina and Florida and other states are tackling this problem head on. They are requiring and mandating, in some instances, that teachers be trained in reading instruction or receive certification in reading instruction in order to teach in the schools. And the state of Louisiana, they even go beyond those measures, where all aspiring and new teachers must complete a year-long residency before entering the profession to demonstrate proficiency in reading data, setting assessments, running classrooms, working with parents, and managing student behaviors. Now, you may agree with me, but I strongly believe if we increase and improve reading instruction and help teachers who struggle with teacher reading, we will increase the graduation rate. We will decrease the dropout rate. We may even displace some of the many excuses that we place on external factors, such as poverty, students' home lives, and other factors, parenting, and focus on reading instruction. We may even disrupt the school-to-prison pipeline theory by shifting the focus away from discipline policies as the reason folks are going to jail to reading instruction as the reason folks are going to jail. And we could affect the lives of black children and their families by eliminating the student achievement gap, which, as we all know, is an ever-persisting problem that seems to only affect black children. Now, we have a lot of work to do. I believe the desire to express reading problems and school failures is common among incarcerated youth. And there is an extraordinary number of incarcerated youth around the world. The United Nations Children's Fund estimates that there is more than one million incarcerated youth around the globe. According to juvenile justice system records, the United States incarcerates more of its youth than any other country in the world. And on any given day, 50 to 60,000 young people are locked up in juvenile jails and prisons. And so that's why I want to spread my idea that is reading instruction and helping teachers who struggle with teaching reading that must improve. But accomplishing this goal requires implementing changes within the university-based teacher preparation programs. And so here's my paradox. As they go about their training and curricula and research practices, we use incarcerated youth as thought partners 
to help them navigate the challenges of teaching reading. These youth have a keen insight and awareness of their own reading challenges and problems and can explain to you the trials and tribulations. And they can strengthen teachers' understanding of where to raise the instructional bar. And if this idea spreads, training and curriculum for aspiring teachers and seasoned educators would include them visiting correctional facilities and speaking directly to incarcerated youth to learn about their school experiences. They would address the literacy issues that incarcerated youth face. They would understand the experiences that led incarcerated youth to jail. They would gain an awareness of the student-teacher interactions that did not forge strong student-teacher relationships, and they would complete field work, field study, to address educational bias against black children and the low-level reading strategies and resources used that keep these children lagging far behind. Not surprisingly, black children are incarcerated at five times the rate of other children. Partnering with incarcerated youth in the process of teacher preparation will accentuate the national conversation about reading instruction. It will inspire intentionality and urgency for reading practices. And it would offer professional learning to all educators of all levels that is steeped in a new unconventional perspective, that of incarcerated youth. So I ask you, in your own lives, to find a way to be part of the action of improving reading instruction. And when you think about reading instruction, think about incarcerated youth. Thank you.